Hello everyone, good morning, happy Tuesday and welcome back to KXAM Live. I'm Esmeralda Zamora and today we're going to be doing some space talk with our very own KXAM, Eric Henriksen. Eric, thanks so much for joining me. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing amazing. Too excited to talk about this topic and today we're going to be discussing the Boeing mission leaving astronauts stranded in space for a couple more months. What can you tell me about this? So earlier in June, the a Boeing Starliner rocket was doing a test run where they ran two astronauts up to the International Space Station. They were going to be there for two weeks and then come back, two weeks tops. But there has been some doubts at the ability of Boeing's rocket to the Starliner to come back down to Earth safely. And so because of that, NASA has put it on hold and they're just going to leave the astronauts up there until February. So several months. This two-week stay has turned to an eight-month stay. They're doing that. So SpaceX is launching a mission in February, or actually it's closer, it's sooner than that. But the return mission will be launched, come back on February. So what they're doing is they have a pod, the Dragon pod, that will have four seats in it. Two of the astronauts who are going to go up are now being kicked off that mission. So when the pod goes up in February, they'll have two extra seats, and these two astronauts can come down. Uh, their names are Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore. And uh, they're just going to spend some time up in space and uh, experience it. A long-term stay. Typically, people don't stay up that long. It's just a few weeks to a few months. Uh, eight months is pretty long. It's, it's, they, people have done longer, but this is a pretty long stay. And how long has the person who has been in space the longest been there for? Right. So this astronaut's name, I wrote this down, Frank Rubio, 371 days. Wow. So it's a pretty long stretch of time. And the reason we're doing these long stretches of time in space travel is because eventually we're going to the moon and we're going to Mars and we're going to be in space a lot longer than 371 days. These are year-long trips that we're looking forward to in our relatively near future. I hope it's more near than relative, but <laughs> we'll see how that works. Uh, the moon, it will be one thing because we'll be able to land there. They'll have gravity. Uh, the trip to Mars is going to be a really long trip. So we're doing these tests on people to see what the impacts are, and they've had a lot of interesting things over the years. Uh, how it impacts their health in some really cool ways. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how this long eight-month stay is going to impact these two astronauts' health and uh, what we could expect in our own future if we get to travel to space. Fingers crossed. I know I want to. Well, first of all, we know that their trip was delayed due to safety concerns. Right. Do you know exactly why the trip was delayed? It was something to do with one of the rockets that was used to stabilize the craft as it came down. There's really technical details, uh, but it was just to make sure it comes down safely. They had issues beforehand. The, the launch was delayed several times, again, because they weren't sure about how it would pull off the launch and how successful it would be. About, I think it was like a decade ago, uh, NASA asked private industries like Boeing and SpaceX to build rockets so they could no longer have to themselves. And you know, it's a little cheaper if a private company does it. So Boeing and SpaceX were selected. As you know, SpaceX has been launching rockets for several years now. They've only had a couple issues. Last month, they had one with the Falcon 9 rockets, and they had to put that on a two-week delay before they launched those again. Those are now back moving up and down. They're actually really cool rockets because they launch and they actually can land at sea, which is pretty crazy. Oh, wow. And they send this thing called the Dragon Capsule up. The Starliner was Boeing's first attempt at this after this prolonged uh, contracted engineering work. And they've had just issues the entire way. And of course, this follows Boeing's issues with the door that fell off the plane a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And they've been having That's to deal with that when it comes to airliners. And now they're having issues with the Starliner. So Boeing's this having is, a rough a few world months. World. And this is just another, this is a another business that itch and a giddy up. Is that, <laughs> is that the proper? That may be the wrong one. You know what I mean, though. One of those fun <laughs> idioms we like to use so much. <laughs> So tell me, what are some of the safety concerns that they are going to be experiencing throughout this prolonged stay? So really cool one, well not cool, hot I guess, is radiation. So when you're in space, you're exposed to a lot more radiation than you are here on Earth. We have a thing called the magnetosphere, which protects us here when we're on the ground. And it prevents any harmful radiation like gamma rays. Those are the type of thing that made the Incredible Hulk the Incredible Hulk. Those don't reach us as readily because of our magnetosphere and because of our atmosphere. In space, your your protection is thin piece of metal between you and the outside. Now, they add a lot of defensive stuff in there, protective things in there to help prevent radiation from going getting in. But it does get in, and it does cause several serious issues over time. Uh, Long-term exposure can increase your, your risk for cancer, for instance. It also uh, causes a risk for heart disease and even cataracts in your eyes is long-term exposure. Now, they're not being exposed to 
deadly amounts of radiation. Again, they are protected by the International Space Station and rockets, spaceships in general, but they are exposed. And over a long time, they're gonna experience those changes. Again, it's not deadly. We've had people up there much longer before. They're fine, but the risk does increase the longer you're up there. And what this helps us do when we study these things is give us a better idea of what sort of defenses we need to prevent radiation exposure in the near future as we travel further and further and further from the planet. So a lot of radiation in space, a lot of heat. You know, people say space is cold. No it's, a, it's a combination of cold and hot. depends on where you're at. Uh, this is one of those heat, is, heat things you need to watch out for. Test. So that's the radiation is a big one. The one you probably think about, look right there. Zero gravity, right? <laughs> Our hair is floating up in the air. There's nothing holding it down. Uh, I'm not sure that's great for stylists or bad for stylists. We'll see in the near future once we start getting hair, hair care up in space. But, yeah, no gravity, so everything's just floating about. What that does, though, is it causes your bones and your muscles to weaken. Think about if you, you know, I, I, had, I had a back injury. I've been telling people about this. I'll do it freely. I had a little back injury last few weeks. Haven't been able to go to the gym. I went yesterday for the first time in a few months. I had a hard time lifting what I was lifting just a couple months ago. Uh, I, I dropped it by 20 pounds or so. I really feel a lot weaker. Now imagine you're not working any of your muscles for prolonged periods and you're in space because there's no gravity pushing you down. Every single day we have a little weight on us. That's the weight of the, the planet's gravity pulling us down, adding some tension to everything we do. Think about walking a mile, the steps you take. There is actual effort you have to exhibit. Now remove all of that and friction too, mind you, because there's not a lot of friction in space, only inside the ship. And your muscles tend to weaken, your bones tend to weaken, they have to little disturbances as you, you know, little issues as you go. And people get weaker, they get smaller over time. You have bone loss density that occurs, it's really annoying. The minerals like calcium that are in your bones, they actually accumulate in other parts of your body and they increase the risk for kidney disease of all things. And your muscles, they do shrink. They shrink uh, quite a bit because of the lack of resistance. Now astronauts do exercise 2.5 hours per day, which is a pretty long workout. I do about an hour and a half. I think that's pretty long, 2.5 hours a day. But again, they're not really fighting any real weight. They have weights on the machines, but they're not facing gravity and their own body weight on top of that. So there's a lot of resistance training, rubber bands. They have some really cool videos out there uh, you can find online that are pretty neat of them using rubber bands and working out on these cool machines that strap them in. Really awesome stuff. Uh, the other thing I like to talk about is vision changes that happen. When you're in space, your eyeball changes shape. This is the, the world of Does that freak you out a little bit? Yeah, that freaks me out. It, it's kind of cool. It, it, it's space called, I have to do this pr properly, space-associated neuroocular syndrome, or SANS, SANS, SANS. So blood collects, and so your eyes flattens. Blood then collects near your optic nerve, and it causes things to actually grow sharper, and then you get those changes to your eyeball. Very weird. Now, those actually usually revert within two weeks. You've returned to the ground, gravity kicks back in, blood shrinks from the head. Uh, you don't have to deal with those issues as much. But it is something to keep an eye out for when you are in space, that your eyes going to change shape. I have astigmatism, so I always wonder, but it makes your eyes sharper. <laughs> Would it be better for me to actually be in space? Will it fix my astigmatism? I'm not quite sure, but it'd be great if it did, right? And then uh, finally, cardiovascular disease is really big in space. And you have issues... Your heart, think about, so your muscles on your body, they're shrinking, right? Your heart's just another muscle. It's your biggest muscle, strongest muscle. It's beating every day of your life. And if it stops beating, well, it's over, right? <laughs> but that does shrink in space. And so when people return to Earth, it's kind of like changing, kind of like when you climb a mountain or something. And your heart has to work harder to pump to get the blood through your body, and it's not used to that. So that causes some issues. I, you will suffer arrhythmia, which is when your heart beats irregularly in space. And these are, again, over long term. So if you take a trip up for over a week or two, not that big a deal. Your body's not going to shrink that much. But over an eight-month period, they're going to have to deal with some of these issues on the way back. And uh, this is a fun one. They have special diets in space. I know everyone sees the, the astronaut ice cream. By the way, that's fake. <laughs> astronaut ice cream they do not eat in space. Because it's crumbly. Do you ever see that? It's like a crumbly. You ever seen that stuff? Yeah. It's like a crumbly. It comes like, like in a bag. Yeah. yeah. You don't want dust in space because it gets into all the equipment. So their food's actually a lot wetter than you would think. Everything's rehydrated. They do shrink it down. But it's all wet yeah, foods. All but problem. because of that, people have... There's a whole thing about getting how you get food in space. It's really cool and fascinating. They do like test runs beforehand to see what foods the astronauts like. They want to make sure they're pro getting the proper nutrition. They send it up. They have these machines that fill it with water and they heat it up. It's all in a bag and they have like, these little forks on them. They, they play these games with their food all the time because like liquid, if you drink out of a straw, it just forms little bubbles and they just float everywhere. So they don't have crumbly food in space, uh, but they do have to have these 
highly nutritious diets because you do get constipated in space. I was building up to this. You get constipated in space <laughs> because you don't have the weight of gravity pulling things through your digestional tract. You know, things are just kind of sitting around, floating around. So people do have issues with uh, their digestion specifically because of this. And so they have these high nutrition foods that help uh, get things moving, I guess you should say. Get things uh, moving. So they will have to deal with some of that. And luckily, they, they always, it doesn't, doesn't matter how long someone's going up to space, they test them, they make sure they got the right food and everything That's ready fine, no just in case. And both these astronauts have been in space before. So this isn't this is, brand new for them. The, the and again, weight loss is, is common this because is of uh, because the food is kind of sits in your belly. You don't feel like eating as much. Easy. So they kind of have to force people to eat. They're, they're, they're on a pretty tight schedule. And they also lose a lot of muscle. Up. They lose a lot of muscle. They lose a lot of weight in general. So getting people to eat more is, is kind of essential, uh, especially because you're, you're just like, oh, I don't feel like eating. Well, because your food's just kind of sitting there floating around. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a really cool health thing. Uh, my favorite health thing, uh, for anyone who ever's ever had a bad back, in space there's no gravity pushing down on you, so your back, uh, you get taller, by the way, I think it's a couple centimeters, and you don't have back pain anymore. I've heard several astronauts talk about how back pain goes away, which is pretty wild to me. That's wild. Now, I know you touched a little bit about when these astronauts will be making it back home. Right. You mentioned SpaceX and them going up there to pick them up. What, what can you tell me about that? So SpaceX has a mission planned. It's going up later this year. It comes back in February. It has four seats. Their Dragon capsule has four seats on it. So what they're going to do is tell two of the astronauts, sorry, you don't get to go up this, this time. And so we'll have two available seats. So when the Dragon goes up and, lo- and docks with the International Space Station, where these astronauts are currently situated, then they'll just carry them back in February. So in February, it's scheduled to return to Earth. So that one will return to Earth at that time. And this is a the Dragon capsule that SpaceX is using. They've used that multiple times now. So it's tested. They're not as concerned about that. They do do, do the double checks, make sure it's still mm-hmm. working, everything's good. But it's something they've used before. So it's not it's not brand new technology. And what, one thing I always reminded of is the International Space Station will actually go away very soon. NASA is making plans to destroy it. Uh, they, all the contracts between the other countries have ended. It's old. It's been up there 20 plus years. I forget, I forget when we put it up. Or mid 90s, I think. So it's 20 plus years it's been up there. It's old. It needs to be replaced. And we're about to build a giant new space station next to the moon is NASA's plan. They're going to land on the moon with Artemis. And then the next step is to build this gateway that they're going to build. It'll be a big space station right around the moon where we'll be able to kind of use that to it's so crazy to talk about this. We're going to use it as a way to buoy ourselves, kind of we dock there, and then go to Mars after that. So we'll have another space station further so out. But for now, the internet is evolving. Space. It's evolving. Space. Technology is coming. We're going out there. We'll be out there very soon. It's going to be really cool. Now, if SpaceX does happen to have any issues, is there a plan B? I think the plan B is just uh, SpaceX will launch another rocket. But they're pretty, and they also have escape pods if they really need to. On the International Space Station. I say escape pods like Star Wars. They're, they have a fancier name. But they're, <laughs> they're escape pods. So there is a way for them to get back. I think it's just kind of like a... You, you don't want to pull that cable unless you absolutely have to. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of thing. So space, I'm, not, I'm not super worried about SpaceX coming to get them. They've been pretty consistent over the last few years. Uh, of getting people up to the International Space Station. Bringing them back. It's a very consistent process they've been on. And they, they have it all kind of laid out very simply. But if not, they also have other rockets, other capsules. And if it takes, we'll just keep sending capsules up there to keep getting people. And eventually we'll get everyone down just in time for us to take the space station down in the next few years. And eventually we'll all be able to go visit the moon, maybe. Yes. Artemis is launching later this decade. We'll have, uh, I think it's Artemis 3 will be the one that's going to land on the moon. Artemis 2 is coming up. It's going to orbit the moon. First time we've orbited the moon since the 70s which is wild, it's been that long, and then we'll land on the moon, and then we'll start colonizing it, and this is NASA's actual plan, we're going to start colonizing the moon, building like permanent settlements on the surface of the moon, there's some spots where they think there's water, so we're going to look around those areas, and set up a whole, you know, we're, we're going out there, it's, we're, we're expanding, it's going to take us a few world. decades, <laughs> whole new world, whole new universe, it's going to be wild. Yep. Well, hopefully these astronauts make it back, like you mentioned, in February. Hopefully everything goes great and smooth with that process. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us about this topic before we go? No, it's, it's pretty cool. There are a couple other big space things this week. We actually did find water on Mars this week, which will help us on our travels. And you may have noticed you were having some issues with like your phones yesterday. Uh, we had a solar storm come through. 
Uh, those are, they happen pretty often. This year, the sun's pretty active, so you may have noticed some disruptions. So if you notice that, that's why. If you're wondering about that, that's space weather. It gets us here even on the ground. So space weather is a thing. And yeah, we had some, we had some cool events in space this week. It's been a wild space week. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure to talk about space and all the latest news going up, going on up there. Um, it was nice to have you, and I can't wait till next Monday, I mean next Tuesday, when we talk about our next space topic. Absolutely. We'll have some fun. Thank you. Well, that's all we have today for our space talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember that this is an ongoing um, segment that happens every Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. Eric is here with us and he has a different topic every time we start the show. So if you want to join us next week, don't forget that's on Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. I'm Esmeralda Zamora and this was KXN Live.